you know, when the crack hit America, it was like so much money. It was like, like them telesayards say, you know, money grew up on tree. <laughs> you know, like you go outside and just pick money off a tree. And, you know, from that, I started out selling what they call $3 bottles of crack cocaine. And then I started selling two for five. And then I started selling them for two dollars because I'm going below the competition because the Americans they wanted to get the five dollars a bottle. I dropped mine to three, you know, and you know, shut the game down. And then from that, a Dominican brother came to me and he gave me my first kilo. You know, I, I sold that in about 20, 30 minutes. Then after that, you know, I worked my way up to 10. And you know, he couldn't really supply the demand. So I uh, hooked up with my uncle. You know, we did our thing, man. From him, he started giving me, you know what I mean? He started me out at five keys. I knocked that out in an hour, then he doubled it up to 10 keys. And he just turned me in the house and gave me 500 keys and said, just take the drugs from this house and put the money in this house and call me when it's done. You know what I mean? And, you know, the rest is history. I wanted to buy a house in Miami, you know, Florida, down on South Beach with swimming pool, jacuzzi, fenced in yard, two car garage. You know, I did all this at like 21, 22 years old. I had millions of dollars. I had all the women, all the jewelry. I had everything you could dream of, you know? But then I had to sit in the cage for 26 years. I'm delighted to introduce a legend, a legend from America who's never been introduced to the UK audience before. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Waynesworth Hall, otherwise known as Unique. Unique, how you doing, brother? I'm fine, man. I'm fine, man. It's a pleasure. You know what I mean? I got a nice subscriber base in the UK over at my YouTube channel, Unique Mech Audio, and it's an honor to be here. I watch your program and I tell my people over here to watch you because, you know, we both in the same field. I'm from Harlem, New York. And, you know, I'm from the old crack era. I got locked up in 1993, didn't come home until 2020. And back when I was on the street, it was all love as far as, you know, we try to make sure we all eat, you know, make sure that, you know, we all on the same platform, we in the same, you know, we, we eating off the same plate, man. And that's why I'm here trying to give him some love. And, you know, so we do what we got to do together as a team. Well, like I said, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. And we're going to be doing lots of work, helping each other up, out from across the pond, doing lots of each other, introducing each other to guests and doing all we can to help each other. But guys, like I said, this story is unbelievable. Unique's just spent 26 years in jail. That's after getting out where he weren't even meant to get out at all on a compassionate release. The story is crazy. Prior to that, this man was the most flashy, flamboyant, and arrogant kingpin in the crack era, the gold <laughs> rush. Yeah, that's but I ain't yeah, insulted yeah. him. That's by his own admission, the most flashy, and exactly. most arrogant. But um, they already know. And they, over here in the states, they label me the cockiest kingpin. <laughs> See, your story is unbelievable. So it's only right that we go back to the start. Well, like we've had, obviously, your start was in Jamaica. Born in Jamaica, spent your first eight years there. So talk to us about the settings, siblings, poverty what your life was like at them times? Okay, uh, it was during the time of the political wars when uh, Michael Manley had Jamaica on lock and Siega was just coming in. So when Siega was trying to, you know, uproot Manley and they was having the big election between um, PNP and uh, JLB, uh, you know, we lived in the gully section, which is PNP. And, you know, Michael Manley had that. And all they did for us was build little shanty huts, man, that when it rained, it leaked, <laughs> you know? But we was willing to kill each other for that, you know? Just to show you how little or nothing we had and the extreme we'll go through to cherish the little or nothing. So, you know, my, my parents got me out of there and up to the States and, you know, we came into Kennedy Airport. And, you know, once we came up here, um, that was in 72 by 78, 79, building up to the big election in 1980 with Siega and Manley, where you see Bob Marley, big uh, shout out and rest in peace to Bob Marley. You know what I mean? Big shout out to Bob 100, Marley. 100, 
you know, where he where he held their both of their hands up trying to bring the peace at the peace rally. At that time, you know, my area lost PMP. So when um Siega came in, he ran everybody, you know, off the island. That was what they call rude boys, and we migrated to you know, New York City, Brooklyn, Connecticut, and Miami area. And, you know, by then I'm about 14, 15, and my older comrades that, you know, I looked up to when I was in Jamaica at seven, eight years old, they was up here and they like, you know, we call ourselves family members. If you're from a yard, you know, I say, you know, everybody are family, you know what I'm saying? So when them come up, you know, I meet up with them again and, you know, at this time, it was the, the, the free base era and the Heron era. This before the crack era. So from that, you know, we were doing our thing in Brooklyn. And, you know what I mean? Then we migrated to like the Bronx, Connecticut, you know, uh, Virginia, D.C. And then the crack hit. You know, when the crack hit America, it was like so much money. It was like, like them Telesayad said, you know, money grew up on tree. <laughs> you know, like you go outside and just pick money off a tree. I, I saw it did a go on, you know, in, in a foreign up here at that time. And, you know, from that, I started out selling what they call $3 bottles of crack cocaine. And then I started selling two for five. And then I started selling them for $2 because I'm going below the competition because the Americans, they wanted to get the $5 a bottle. I dropped mines to three. So they dropped theirs to three. So I dropped mines to two bottles for $5. So then when they started doing that, then I just dropped my bottle to straight $2. Then when they started doing that, after 8 o'clock, I started selling the bottles for $1 a piece after 8 o'clock, from, from 8 to 12, you know, and, you know, shut the game down. And then from that, you know, they started coming to me because I knew how to cook it up. Because back when I was running in Brooklyn, you know, with the posses, you know, that was doing the free base era, so I knew how to cook, you know, to make it pure. So instead of putting extra baking soda, extra comeback and all that on it, I just put, you know what I mean, straight cocaine and the least amount of baking soda to keep it pure. And they started copping from me. Then uh, a Dominican brother came to me and he gave me my first kilo. You know, I, I sold that in about 20, 30 minutes. Then after that, you know, I worked my way up to 10 and, you know, he couldn't really supply the demand. So I uh, hooked up with my uncle you know, who's the one who put out R. Kelly. I know y'all over there know who R. Kelly is. Well, my uncle, my connect, rest in peace, David Hyatt on Tab Dash Records. You know, he was in England too for a number of time. If you're from England, you're about that money, you know David Hyatt. But he died in federal prison in Buckner, North Carolina in 2016. That was my connect. I know I got a strong New York accent, but that's because that's where I was at and that's where I control. But we still know for talk yeah, when I time for switch up on them things there. But you know, we you know, we did our thing, man. From him, he started giving me, you know what I mean? He started me out at five keys. I knocked that out in an hour, then he doubled it up to 10 keys. And he just turned me in the house and gave me 500 keys and say, just take the drugs from this house and put the money in this house and call me when it's done. You know what I mean? And you know, the rest is history. I wanted to buy a house in Miami, you know, Florida, down on South Beach with swimming pool, jacuzzi, fenced in yard, two car garage. You know, I did all this at like 21, 22 years old. You know, um, you know, it was a good run, you know, but go ahead. Uh, I want to be all day. Yeah, the, the story is crazy. The story is insane. To, to obviously done so much at such an early age, being away for nearly 30 years and still come out and not even be 60. It's insane. Mm -hmm. But you know, back slightly, obviously, when you first come over to America and when you're on the streets and chilling with the olders and stuff like this, was there, was there like a separation where you were just the Jamaican people who'd come over or were you mixing with the American people? Oh, no, no, no. Let's get that right. You know what I mean? The Jamaicans, we had a bad name. They looked at us like if we was, we was animals from a third world country and you know what I mean? So... They laughed at us because when we had talked to me, kind of them things that are, are dialect, not the same as them dialects. So, you know, them are laugh on us. So we have to fight them and put the knuckles on them. You know what I'm saying? And then we, you know, we pull out the ratchet, you know, and then of course it got to the gun and them things there. But, you know, we just do what we have to do. And, you know, them never did like us. You know what I mean? But them know we bust our gun and, you know, we're not a player because we take things to the extreme. You know what I'm saying? To the extreme, <laughs> you know? So, we don't believe in taking laws. And just for the record, so I can let the people know, um, my grandfather 
is uh, first cousins with Marcus Garvey. You know, my mother's maiden name is Mary Garvey. And, you know, Mary Avina Garvey. You know, it's all documented in the records. But, you know, when I come up, I wasn't taught none of that. You know, I just come up and I hit the streets. And like I said, I come up with, you know, with what them call, you know, the rude boy them. So where I run upon the streets and I do with things on, you know, at that time, I couldn't even read or write when I went to jail. I made millions of dollars and couldn't read or write, but I knew how to, uh, how to count, you know? Like up here in the States, I learned how to read a triple beam scale before I learned my ABCs. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? All I was taught was math, you know, and how to read a scale from ounce to quarter ounce, you know what I mean? To half a quarter and so on to make sure the money fluctuate, you know what I mean? But, you know, like I said, I just wanted to point that out as far as that, you know, I'm a descendant of Marcus Garvey. And right now I'm trying to do something positive, you know, for the youth to give back. Because at the time I didn't have the knowledge and understanding of my purpose here or my purpose on earth. You know what I mean? They just threw a whole bunch of drugs in, you know, our neighborhoods in America. And I grabbed it and I mastered it and became king at it. And hence, they labelled me a kingpin. Before you obviously got into the selling of the drug game, there was a point where you were robbing and you end up using the free base and trying the free base in your sort of teenage, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, I was up in Washington Heights. They had the Dominicans up there. That's where all the drugs was at. And, you know, me at Jamaica and whatever, wherever the, the, the money there, I saw where I go, you know. So we go up there for take the money and... You know, we back out upon a man and run up upon him and catch him upon the roof and, you know, take him up to the roof and, you know, and man them come up there and start shoot. Boom, 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 boom. You know, gunshots, gunshots, you know, gunshots, nothing but gunshots. You know what I mean? So, you know, they shoot and I'm holding the man hostage and, you know, they just shot they man I'm holding and I wound up getting hit in the right hip, the left hip. You know what I mean? Get hit up in the chest. I mean, all types of things happen, man. It was like just, you know, I wound up having to jump off a six story building. You know what I mean? To save my life, you know, because it was all coming on the roof. Had me and my partner calling it up on the roof. So, yeah, I've been through my little trials and tribulations, but, you know, that's what made me the man I am today, where I could speak to the youth and let them know it wasn't worth it. I had 30 cars at one time. You know what I mean? 30 cars at one time. You understand? And, you know what I mean? I had millions of dollars. I had all the women, all the jewelry. I had everything you could dream of, you know? But then I had to sit in the cage for 26 years. Yeah, uh, as much as the good times are unbelievable, it's just not worth it. The sacrifice isn't worth it, is it? It's all about being out here. Freedom's priceless, isn't it? The rest of it is comes and goes. You can't take none of that with you. But um, so you've ended up obviously you're on the wrong path. Well, the real wrong path in the robbing and all that sort of stuff. You've ended up going to jail and or prison, as you call it out there. And so obviously, is that mm -hmm. you ended up getting clean initially, getting off the drugs when you're in prison? Yeah, now it wasn't even about the prison. It's about my mother. You know, my mother, you know, talked to me on the phone and she let me know she didn't bring me to America to do to do that. But then freebasing was something that everybody was doing. Like right now, everybody smoke weed. You know what I mean? Everybody smoke herbs and ganja. You know, that's how they was smoking cocaine back in the early 80s. It was, you know, they, 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 to give them a good understanding over there in the UK, the United States... You know, um, drugs are went on national TV and said cocaine wasn't a gateway drug. You yeah. understand? They said it wasn't addictive. You know, that's because only, you know, white people used it at the time. Rich white people and rich black people. Poor people wasn't using it. That's before crack. Then when they saw that, you know, we were starting to elevate ourselves here in America, just blacks in general, then they flooded it with cocaine and then came out with something called mandatory minimum Meaning if you get caught with this much, you know, uh, crack cocaine, you're looking at five to life. When, you know, the black people sold that, but the white people sold powder cocaine. But you got to get caught with this much powder cocaine before you're even looking at five years. But you get caught with, with a, a pinch of your pinky of crack and you're looking at five to life. And they only charge black people in the courts with crack. It's, it's the same in this country right now today in England, you know, in terms of the crack and the coke and you're getting kingpins, white kingpins getting caught with hundreds of kilos and you're getting young black boys who get caught with a few stones of crack and a bit of, and they're getting the same sentences and it's crazy. And you gotta remember and keep in mind, like I said, I'm a historian when it comes to the crack and drug era, you know, and American street, you know, gangsterism history. At the time, um, they was really on the Colombians for trying to get 
the cocaine through like uh, Miami ports. That's where it was coming from. So the, the, the cartels started using Jamaica to bring it through Jamaica. That's how we started freebasing in Jamaica where we thought it was normal. And so like you said, luckily you've ended up getting clean in jail or prison, as you call it out there. You've come out and then you've ended up initially being around your, you, you, aren't you one of 13 siblings? Am I correct in saying that? Yes, yes, yes. I got six brothers and sisters. Crazy, you know? crazy. So when you've come out from prison on that first bid, you've ended up starting working one of your older brothers, didn't you, in the herb gate, as you call it out there, before the... the no, that wasn't when I came out of prison. I was doing that when I was a juvenile. That's what, you know, prepared me and shaped me into knowing how to sell cocaine and heroin, you know what I mean, to get into the drug game. You know, when I came out of prison, you know, the last time my older brother was locked up for attempt murder doing seven and a half to 23 upstate New York and I came home, I'm the baby. Now the baby's out here with nobody, you know what I mean? And, you know, I walked into the crack era. So everything I learned from selling herbs in the Bronx and, you know, heroin in Brooklyn, I put it together and I went to Harlem and I put a stronghold on Harlem and did what I had to do in Harlem. And, you know, took over Harlem, wound up getting a club called Club 2000, a uh, recording studio and record shop called um, Mecca Audio. That's why my YouTube channel is named Unique Mecca Audio, because I'm unique. Mecca Audio was my brand and my studio and my record label. I did all back that all that back then from the guidance of, you know, my uncle David Hyatt that I told you put out R. Kelly. Of course. And so talk to me about, obviously, you've come out of jail at a certain point during the crack era, yeah? And this is literally yeah. the gold rush. What was New York like at them times when you've come out to see this crack thing that sort of hit the streets? Look, I spent $100, and off that $100, I made $1,200. I made $1,200 in, like, two hours. You know what I mean? From $100. So how do you say no to that when you don't have nothing and you're just coming out of prison and you can't read, can't write, and America didn't have no job for poor black people? You know what I mean? So, I mean, we had no choice but to do what we had to do, you know? And so from there, you know, when you've seen this crap things going off, what was the, how did you set up your business? Did you copy the herb gate and were you in the flat doing it from the flat or were you on the corner on the streets doing it? I, I, I just went, I went up what they call up the hill, I went up there brought me an ounce and, you know, got me a pistol and, you know, hit the street corner and did it like the Americans did it at the time. You know what I mean? And, you know, from there then, um, cause back then you couldn't do it like we was doing the herbs back then as far as behind the closed door, because there was too many people on, on the flats on the, on the street that was selling them. So they would never make it up to the apartment because they had other opportunities to buy drugs from right on the street. So I had to go on the street in the mix with them. You understand? Yeah. And so like you say, you've made, ended up making $1,200 in a couple of hours and then you're hooked from that moment. And then so you must have made, the money must have come in quick then from there. And I mean, I made $1,200 from the $1,200. I bought three ounces and from the three ounces, now I got $4,000, $5,000. All this is in my first day hustling. I made $5,000 my first day. So I take the 5,000 in the morning, I go back and I buy nine and a half ounces. You know, by the end of that day, now I got enough to buy a kilo. I done made 20,000 my second day. That's how fast money was coming in America. Ah, oh, Jesus. That's crazy. That's crazy. And talk to me, whereabouts was it that you were hustling? Was it Washington Heights that you were based? At, these no, at, times? This, time, at this time, I was in Harlem. Washington Heights was the hub. But when I, when I realized, I already knew because I was going up there when I was freebasing, when I was a kid, I was going to Washington Heights, you know what I mean, to go uh, 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 rob them. That's how I got shot up and all of that. So I knew where the drugs was at and they knew my gangster. So I just went up to Washington Heights with my pistol and told them, look, I ain't come up here to rob y'all. I come up here to make some money, put my bag of money on the table. I said, I don't want nothing extra. I just want my, what my money's worth. And once they saw I wasn't into the badness no more and it was about the business of, of it, you know, they was dying to throw drugs at me. So then I take the drugs and I bring it back to Harlem and I started selling it for cheaper than they were selling it up the hill in Washington Heights to the blacks and the brothers down in Harlem to cut them off from going up the hill. I brought the drugs down the hill for cheaper than it was up the hill. And that was my strategy right there. So I didn't have to worry about selling the $2 bottle and $3 bottle no more. Now I'm selling, you know what I mean? Quarter key, half a key. You understand what I'm saying? You know, 
and you know, and kilos and doing my thing right there in Harlem to to stop them from going up the hill, you know, to Washington Heights that the Dominicans had on lock. Because up there, you, there wasn't no blacks hustling up there at the time. You know what I mean? But then when my money started growing, you know, it, I, I, I wanted in. So now when I got with my uncle and he started giving me the 500 keys, the same people that I used to buy it from up the hill to bring it down the hill, now I'm up the hill supplying them. You and understand what I'm saying? Crazy. Crazy. And so who was your uncle connected with? He was connected to the Colombians, wasn't he? He was connected to the Cali cartel. Because Washington Heights was being ran by the uh, Medellin, however you pronounce it, the Medellin. But uh, he was connected to the Cali cartel, and the Medellin had Washington Heights on lock. If anybody from the Cali cartel tried to sell drugs up in Washington Heights, the Medellin wouldn't do nothing to them. They'll just send word back to Colombia and kill their grandmother, their kids, their uncle, their dog, their pet monkey, Bubbles, you know what I mean? Anything connected with them and let them stay alive here in America to suffer so other people see how they went crazy losing their whole bloodline behind them trying to sell drugs on their turf. That's how vicious it was. But me, me a Jamaican, you know, I, I don't run with them. So that didn't apply to me. So I went up there with my pistol and, you know, did what I had to do. Of course. And so talk to me about the prices then before, obviously, when you're dealing with the Dominicans, what were you paying? And then what did it, when you start dealing with your uncle, how much did the price drop then? What were you paying per, per kilo at them times then? Back then it was like 12, 14,000, you know, from the Dominicans and my uncle started giving it to me for like eight and 10,000. So it left me room to make between two and four, just selling it to the Dominicans. But the way it worked in, in America and anywhere in America, you could, you're could you not going anywhere to hustle because you're going to get, you know, static. You know what I mean? You're going to get, you know, but once you got a better price than everybody else, now you don't have static. All the thing you have is stick up boys, what we call them. You know what I mean? These are the guys coming to rob you. I, I got a lot of friends of mine that died trying to sell out of town in another town. You understand what I'm saying? Had you seen millions before you got with your uncle in terms of money? Or was it you seeing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands? And then was it a real big step up once you got with the uncle and the Colombian plug, was it? Now, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a humongous step when I got with my uncle. But I was already, you know, handling millions for other people. Yeah. Before to my uncle because oh, now I'm getting to the price where I could make most of the profit instead of giving them most of the profit because like over here in the states a lot of people used to do stuff like I give them a key I get a key for let's say eight ten thousand I give it to them for fourteen thousand you know what I mean but on the streets it's going for seventeen or eighteen so I give them a three thousand dollar window you know what I mean profit off of each key so then then they'll open up that key and take a hundred grams out of that and put in a hundred grams of cut and off of every 10 keys, they made an extra key plus the 4,000 off the original key. So that's 40,000 they make for the 10, for the 10 keys. And then they got another whole key that they're going to put. So they make 60,000, you know, 60, 70 easy. You know what I mean? Or off of 10 keys by the time they took a hundred grams out of each pack. Of course. And so, but talk to me then once you ended up getting with your uncle, how you set up your little team, or if you had a team where you were a one man band, or did you have some right hand man and enforcers within your team? And we have a, obviously with violence in order to protect your thing, protect the corner. Get Listen, I had a Glock nine millimeter with 17 shots and I had a Smith and Wesson with 17 shots. That's my team. You understand what I'm saying? So when I started selling, I go to a block and I tell, you go on one of the blocks up the hill in Washington Heights and you got 40 guys selling, you know, cocaine on the block. I'm not going to deal with 40 individuals. I tell them I got a better price than everybody else got. This is what I want. I'm just going to deal, you know what I mean, with Christian. You know what I mean? Christian, you get me the money. When you got the money for 20 keys, you call me. You understand what I'm saying? So you get the money from everybody else to bring it together, to bring it to me. You understand? And if anything go wrong, only person I got to deal with is Christian. And I got 17 shots in both hands, one for each one of Christian's eyeballs. You know what I mean? So I don't have to worry about Christian doing nothing stupid because I get rid of him. I get somebody else that's going to play fair. When they hear about the way I handle Christian, I don't have a problem anymore. <laughs> you know? Of course, I hear you. But you know, in this country, so you got... When people start getting a bit of name, start making a bit of money, 
there might be a man like yourself who's feared, but a lot of time people have to move their family out the area because the family are the sort of the easy. No, that was already done. Yeah, that was already done. My mother was in Florida. That's what I'm telling you. That's why I had the house in Miami. My mother was in Florida. My family was out in Jersey, and I was the only one in Harlem. Nobody even yeah, knew no. where I came from. You understand? Other than I came with that money, and I didn't play no games. Of course. But, um, and so but in New York, obviously, I know that, obviously, like you said, you weren't scared to use your peas, Jamaican, and all that, but there were some feared wolves that I've heard about, people like Preakshaw and these Haitian Jack sort of characters, and these very dangerous sort of characters. Did you come across these characters your time? And you still must have had run-ins with these people, like even... Listen, man, listen, listen, listen. A wolf is a wolf is a wolf is a wolf, and a wolf, wolf no a wolf. You understand what I'm saying? Meaning, you know, before you do anything, even the police, before they do a raid, they do their research and they know how to go and how to come. You understand what I'm saying? And they think of the repercussions of what could happen. You understand? So, yes, I was out there for the preachers and the Haitian Jacks and everybody else. But like I said, you know, everybody, you know, they know who busting their gun and who not busting their gun. You understand what I'm saying? So you, you know who to go at. You got people that when people like those men you name go at them, they go to somebody to protect them from that person. You understand? But, you know, when you go to somebody to protect you from somebody, you showing you weak. So once they protect you from that person, they're going to take what you got. You know what I mean? So, you know, I, I bust my gun, I, 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 I shoot first, I don't ask questions later, and I don't care who get hit. All I care about is me surviving and getting away, and that's the way that is. But there was plenty of wolves out there. All the wolves you just named was out there, plus a whole bunch more. You know what I mean? But, but men respect men. You understand what I'm saying? Men respect men. There's a lot of dudes that was getting money that couldn't protect the money. And those are the ones that those men that you mentioned went after. But I wasn't one that they could easily come after like that. Of course, of course. And it's not like you were low key with the whole thing as well. Like you said, at certain points, you end up getting the nightclub. You were the most flashy. You were in the I night. Got 30 cars. night. I'm buying, I'm, I, look, I'm wearing a yellow jacket right now in the blacks. So I said, man, you know. I'm wearing a yellow black outfit. I gotta go get a yellow and black car to match my outfit for the night. So, you know, I go to the deal. I say, yo, give me that car, make it yellow, give me yellow and black interior, and give me some chrome rims with, with yellow on the outside. And I build a car to match a, a, a jacket. I don't get a, a, a jacket to match the car. That's how flashy I was. I had 30 cars at one time. Whatever I wanted, I got. That's how fast money coming in. Remember, I told you I'm selling 20 keys at a time. So it wasn't nothing I couldn't get. And so talk to me about what your nightclub was like as well. Wasn't it called Club 2000? My nightclub created majority of the major rappers and moguls that you see today from America. We had Queen Latifah up there. We had uh, Treachy Naughty by Nature. You know, by the way, I wrote the Hip Hop Parade. Hey, you know what I mean? I, we got the uh, Dougie Fresh. I wrote the A.O. I. You know what I mean? We had Brand Nubian. We had SWV. We had Mary J. Blige. You know, we had Andre Harrell. We had everybody come through my club. Onyx. You know, if you was anybody, you came through my club. You know? And they paid me to come on my stage because back then, it wasn't about the rappers. It was about the drug dealers. And I was one of the kings of the drug dealers. So they paid me to be in my presence. Crazy, crazy. Now, like I see from the pictures, you were the life and soul of the party. And clearly, obviously, the energy that you possess even today is a clear why, you know? It, it, it's about getting to the bag, man. Getting to the bag of money by any means necessary. If you died trying, you died honorable. You know what I mean? And when you get caught, you don't tell. When I got caught, I didn't tell on anyone. Not one of my connects, not one of my, my the people that I supplied, nobody went down with me. I took, I went to trial, I blew trial, and I took my life plus 20 years. They told me when they, they killed my brother, shot him two times in the head. You understand? On the next episode, I explain to you more about that. But my brother got shot two times in the head. And then they told me that I could blame everything on my brother, tell them what happened, because they really wanted to know how I was able to do everything on my own. And they'll let me go free by me just putting it on my brother that died. But I could never tell on any man, dead or alive, because that's not a part of the real street code.